Hi everybody, this is Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicles, Stories of the Supernatural. And today our story has to do with a very famous haunted house located on Staten Island. It's the Chrysler Mansion, and this is the story of a haunting. It sits right now on land atop Chrysler Hill and Arthur Kill Road in Charleston, Staten Island, New York. It's been restored to its former glory as a stick-style example of architecture. It looks exactly as what most people think of as a traditional Victorian haunted house. The thing is, it really is haunted. If walls could talk, then the Chrysler Mansion would speak volumes about violence, murder, possible infidelity, and it all started over 130 years ago. In 1854, Balthasar Chrysler, a Bavarian immigrant, who became wealthy with his brick-making empire, moved to the area and established a factory. He provided housing and jobs to the citizens of Androvetville, as it was known then, and eventually the town was renamed to Chrysherville in his honor. He was generous to his workers, but was said to be an unbending taskmaster and a strong paternal figure who was very strict with his employees. Should one of the men miss a day's work, from a long evening of beer at a local tavern, Kreischer would go through the town bellowing out the man's name and telling him to get back to work. The business prospered. However, in his personal life, Balthasar had suffered a tremendous loss only a year before. In 1853, his wife Carolyn had died within days of giving birth to their seventh child, a son they named Edward. Maybe she died due to complication in childbirth, as did so many women of this time. Or maybe it was heartbreak as well. Only four years before, they had buried six-year-old Henry Kreischer in the family plot at Greenwood Cemetery. Balthasar was pragmatic, and by 1858, he had built himself a mansion which he named Fairview on a hill just east of Arthur Kill Road, which overlooked the town and the brick factory. He also had a new wife named Matilda. They had two children, neither which survived into adulthood. During this time, he also built a church and a post office for the town. 1877 arrived, and this was not a good year for Balthasar. Matilda died, and his factory burned down. And even though it was rebuilt, these events no doubt led him to retiring in 1878, and handing the reins of the business over to his now adult sons, George, Charles, and Edward, who were already members of the firm. In 1884, construction started on two new mansions close to Balthasar's Fairview Villa, designed to be mirror images of the other. It's not clear Balthasar had them built for his sons, or if it was Charles and Edward who commissioned them to house their own families. Each of these brothers had married sisters, Antonia and Frida Lanier. The houses were completed in 1885, and Balthasar died in 1886. Balthasar's passing set in motion unfortunate and tragic circumstances that he could not have foreseen. Upon his death, he divided his business between five of his surviving children. His oldest son, George, bought the interest in the business from his two sisters, thus giving him control of the immense brickworks business. He then dismissed his brother Charles, who had been in charge, and appointed Edward and a stranger named William Linderoth as superintendent. It's now 1891, and after being dismissed by George, or resigning of his own volition, Charles left on an extended trip to Europe. He then went to work for the Weber Brick Company of Perth Amboy. During this time, the factory burnt down for the second time, and it was rebuilt. However, the Chrysler business was in decline. In June of 1894, Edward Chrysler committed suicide by shooting himself in the head. He had been found not far from the factory by a young employee. The reasons given were disagreements with his older brother, George Chrysler, and William Linderoth. However, the family claimed that the relationship between the brothers was a happy one. Testimony from family, friends, and workers at the factory point to everything but that. William Linderoth was so disliked 
that he had been attacked by the factory workers and injured, and he was told to leave the town when rumors were circulating that he was to blame for Edward's suicide. Behind the scenes and the Victorian morality of the times, rumors had been swirling that Edward's wife, Frida, was allegedly having an affair with a doctor, Walker Washington, who lived in nearby Tottenville. She was reported as being prostate with grief when she learned of Edward's suicide. But whether the stories of the affair were true or not, within 18 months she had married Dr. Washington on Christmas Eve of 1895. Could this have contributed to Edward's decision to take his own life? Possibly. But whatever devils drove him to take this action, he apparently did not find the peace he sought for he is reported to be one of the spirits that haunt his brother's home. His widow, Frida, is thought to be the female ghost seen in the home. However, she lived for many more years and was reported alive and well in the 1900, 1910, and 1920 census as Mrs. Washington. It appears she had passed away by 1930, and her husband, Walker, died in 1939. Edward's suicide was the beginning of the end for the Kreischers and their business, and in 1899 they declared bankruptcy and the factory was won at auction by Captain Peter Androvet, a member of a prominent family who had lived in the area since the 1700s. He kept the name of the company, but by 1927 the factory had closed and it was raised in 1936. In 1916, as World War I was drawing to a close, Anti-German sentiment was high, and the name of the town was changed from Kreischerville to its present name of Charleston in order to honor Charles, but not sound so Germanic. George Kreischer, who might have played a part in the suicide of his younger brother Edward, died in 1910 in his home in Manhattan, where he had lived for many years. Charles Kreischer, the last surviving son, had also moved to New York by the time he passed away in 1917. Balthasar's youngest daughter, Louisa, had married into the Steinway family of Steinway and Sons piano fame and moved away. Many of the members of both of these prominent families are buried in Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn. The homes built by the Kreischers, left unattended, fell into disrepair, and Balthasar's Fairview Mansion burnt down in the 1930s, and Edward's Mansion was torn down in the 1940s only leaving Charles home, sitting atop Kreischer Hill. Neither one of these events claimed any lives, and records cannot be found to substantiate the claim that one of the Kreischer sons and his wife died in a fire, or for another death, which was described as a German cook, who either committed suicide by hanging or was murdered in the kitchen of one of the homes in the early 1900s. In 1968, the Kreischer mansion was made into a landmark, thus sparing it from demolition in the future, and in 1982 it was placed on the National Register of Historic Places. A view of the property during the 1980s showed that it stood unattended with a locked gate at the entrance, and the shrubbery around it overgrown and blocking a full view of the house from the street. Throughout the years, the house had gained a reputation as being haunted, and in the late 1990s, When it was a Victorian-style restaurant and allegedly run as a front for the mob, employees and patrons reported spooky experiences while working there. A busboy described hearing sounds of arguing and doors shutting when he went down to the basement, which he couldn't account for. Others complained of being touched and grabbed. By 1999, the house was once again deserted after the restaurant failed. In 2000, Isaac Yamatovian bought and started to restore the property to its former grandeur, even changing its exterior color from white to a military green and yellow. Mr. Yamatovian did not live in the area and hired an ex-Marine, Joseph Joe Black Young, as caretaker to look after the property. He did not know that Joe Black had connections to organized crime and had been dishonorably discharged from the armed forces after only a few months for going AWOL. In 2005, Joe Black was hired by the mob to kill Robert McAlvey, who had his own ties to organized crime and supposedly owed money. An isolated mansion under renovation 
where he was the only occupant probably seemed a perfect place to carry this out. Joe and Michael Maggio lured Robert McKelvey to the mansion. Once there, Joe attacked him and McKelvey died only after he had been stabbed, strangled, and finally drowned in an ornamental pool close to the entrance of the home. Afterwards, Stefan Sicali and Jose Garcia were called in to help dispose of the body. McKelvey's remains were left in a shed while they went to Home Depot for supplies. Upon returning to the house, the body was dragged into the kitchen and placed on a mattress where it was bled out in order to facilitate dismemberment. The body parts were then taken into the cellar and incinerated in the furnace. A few days after he had disappeared, McKelvey's sister filed a missing persons report. However, a year went by and no one except the killers knew exactly what had become of McKelvey and that his charred remains, which consisted of ashes, a bone and teeth, were disposed of in a well just outside the entrance to the house. This homicide might have gone undiscovered, except that a year later, one of the participants in the murder, Stefan Sicali, turned informant and told the FBI about what occurred. Ironically, the fact that the house was being renovated worked in Joe's favor when the furnace was replaced with a newer one, thus eliminating a source of evidence. But even that didn't stop Joseph Young from being convicted and sentenced to life in 2009. Gino Galestro, who ordered the hit, was sentenced to 20 years. Sakali was put in the witness protection program and let off for time served. These events did not detract from the mansion's appeal, and in 2009, scenes from HBO's Boardwalk Empire was filmed there. The scene where Richard Harrow, played by Jack Houston, murders Franklin Warner, played by James Reardon, was shot on the second floor of the Kreischer Mansion. During the filming, cast and crew reported several strange happenings over the 12 hours of the shoot, including the scene where they describe props moving without explanations and cameras turning themselves on and off, Members of the crew reported seeing a little girl dressed in period clothing who seemed to be lost. There were only two actors in the scene, both men, and there were no extras called for in the background. In 2016, Discovery Channel's Paranormal Lockdown featured the site in the sixth episode of the series. So, who are the ghosts walking the halls of the Kreischer Mansion? Edward Kreischer is probably one of them. You might think that the obvious reason is that he committed suicide. But I think that it has more to do with the actual reasons he did it, or even if he did commit suicide at all. The newspapers reported on this incident cite that workers present at the factory that morning claimed he appeared to be in a good mood just a short time before his body was discovered. Even then, this was considered a suicide under mysterious circumstances. He was only 43 years old, wealthy, married, with an 11-year-old son, and only had his older brother George to answer to. His grief-stricken brother Charles supposedly held seances in order to contact him and get the most important of answers, which is why he had done this. These seances are thought to be another source for the hauntings, and considering how popular spiritualism was at this time, there was probably more than one attempt to contact Edward. The problem could have arisen if an inexperienced medium or just a plain charlatan inadvertently opened a doorway to the spirit world, which remained open, allowing any and all entities access to come and go as they pleased. As to the lady ghost who's been heard wailing, and who appeared to former owner Joe McBratney in the 1990s, my bet is on Matilda Kreischer, not Frida. Why, you ask? Well, Frida, whether heartbroken or not, married someone else shortly thereafter, and lived for many more years. However, Matilda was a different story. She was only 52 years old when she died in 1877. By then, she had buried two children, one of them Alfred, who died in 1863 when he was only five years old. He could be the ghost child, heard when all is quiet. Matilda lived in the Fairview Mansion, only a stone's throw from this location, and there's no denying her connection with her stepchildren and their families since they were so young themselves when she married Balthasar and became a mother figure for them. And then there's what I call the forgotten ones. These are all the people who lived their lives anonymously 
inside the walls of the Chrysler mansion or worked in the Chrysler brick factory, which was less than half a mile from the house, who experienced moments of extreme emotion, whether unhappiness or grief, in the shadow of their wealthy patrons. How many servants lived in this home throughout the years? How many secrets and tragedies befell them, possibly leaving some stuck in limbo, yearning for someone to explain what happened to them or an opportunity to tell their story? They could be the source of residual sounds and feelings, their imprint, part of the emotional fabric of this place. For example, in an article dated October 1, 1904, reported on the fatal injury of Lewis Eckert, an engineer who worked at the brickyard and who died after his arm was crushed by machinery. Maybe there were others like Robert McKelvey who met a gruesome end in or around the mansion. However, there were never circumstances which allowed the truth of their demise to come to light, as it did in this homicide case. You only have to visit sites like the Doe Network, which catalogs missing persons and unidentified human remains to understand how a person can be killed and never be found, or in some cases identified as a victim. These unknowns account for many intelligent hauntings and are found in locations where you least expect to. I think there's a plethora of candidates who gave the Chrysler Mansion its reputation for being haunted throughout its long history, long before McKelvey was killed there. And if his spirit lingers on, he must be looking around and asking, who are all these people? As of February 2020, the house is up for sale for a little over $1.7 million. It boasts seven bedrooms, three bathrooms, 4,500 square feet, and sits on a little over an acre of land. But let's move on. Let's get into a few scary ghost stories, because that is what you're here for, right? Although I currently live in North Carolina, I was born and raised in a split level in Staten Island, New York. Traditionally, when people think of Staten Island, they think of Italian girls with orange tans, the old orange fairies, and pseudo-Brooklyn accents. There was a place, though, once upon a time called Willowbrook. Go on, look it up, if you don't believe me. It housed the mentally ill, the emotionally unstable, and the developmentally delayed. This place was full of neglect and abuse. This place was exclusively for children. This place has been abandoned for years. It has always been a tradition for the kids on Staten Island to go to the abandoned Willowbrook and explore the ruins at night. If you wanted to get your adrenaline pumping, you didn't ride the cyclone in Coney Island. You went to Willowbrook. The abandoned buildings were mostly brick red. Ceilings were caved in. The walls were covered with graffiti, and the area was heavily wooded. There were three dangers we had to look out for. The first, abandoned rusted equipment. No one had cleared the area out, so there were still many unwanted items from the past left scattered. The second, dilapidated floors and staircases. Decades of neglect was causing the structures to fall apart at the seams. The third, the homeless. Number three was what scared me the most. Supposedly, once the facilities closed down, the patients and caretakers, without family or anywhere else to go, returned. The abandoned Willowbrook was a safe place where they could live and take care of each other. It was a home of a man named Andre Rond, who was convicted of murdering countless developmentally delayed children. Legends around a ghoul named Cropsey who preyed on children originated in this small place full of sad memories. This place was very real, and I was equally parts terrified and excited to go there. The first time I visited, I was freshly 14 and a freshman in high school. I went with a group of potheads intending to get high and run around in the area in the dark. We weren't even at the entrance for 10 minutes before a few cops escorted us home. My second visit was, unfortunately, unplanned. Due to the aforementioned drug use and general teenage misbehavior, not to mention falling ill with a pesky muscular disease during high school, the university I attended, the only one I could get into, happened to be right across the street. During finals week, my sophomore year, the library was open until midnight so students could study for finals. I didn't drive at the time, still don't, so my mother was supposed to pick me up once I was done. 
I left the library with a handful of students who had actually been studying, and they locked the door behind us. It was at this moment, as everyone walked away, that my phone rang. Hello? It's Mom. The car broke down. I can't pick you up. Can you take the bus home? Sure. There's a shuttle that goes right to the ferry. I can take the train from there. Okay, see you soon. Bye. My mother and I weren't exactly on the best of terms. The car was always breaking down, yet somehow fixed the next day. The campus at this point was impossibly dark. There were only a few lights coming from faraway buildings. The library behind me started to burn off its lights as I started to cross the dark field between me and the shuttle bus waiting area. I watched as the last shuttle bus of the evening pulled up, which only a handful of students were waiting for. I broke into a run. Something held me back. A gloved hand covered my mouth, while an arm grabbed me hard around the waist. I tried to scream, but only my feeble, muffled attempts could be heard. Shh! Don't struggle! A voice hissed into my ear. His still breath was overwhelming my nose. I watched helplessly as the last shuttle bus of the night drove away. Once it was gone, I knew we were the only two people left on this area of the campus. He flicked his tongue into my ear. The feeling sent a chill to the core of my spine. I'm going to remove my hand from your mouth, he whispered hoarsely. You aren't going to scream. If you do, I will hurt you. Understand? I nodded my head quickly. He pulled the gloved hand away from my face. I inhaled the chill, crisp air as he pulled my cell phone from my pocket and put it into his own. My waist was still restrained, but my legs weren't. He had his free hand in my bag. I assumed to look for valuables amongst my political science and media textbooks, of which I had none. He was standing stupidly at just the right angle. I kicked behind me as hard as I could. He crumpled to the floor, hand between his thighs. I dropped my bag and started to run. Stupid bitch, he called after me. Thankfully, it took him a few moments to find his own feet. I was never much of an athlete, but in times of peril, whether it be bullies chasing me in high school or at this point, I always seemed to find the wind beneath my feet. My idea was to go to the road behind campus and stop a car, any car, and go to the police. Once I reached the well lit street, I waited for a car to come zooming by. None came. At this point, I had two choices. Either run down the well lit street until I came to the block where the Orthodox Jewish families lived or run into the dark woods across the street. I was running out of energy. I knew he'd be able to catch up to me if I stayed on the street. I thought in that moment I could hear his fast-paced footsteps behind me. I ran across the street and into the woods. I ran until the light from the street lamps were gone, and I was engulfed in darkness. Wiping the cold sweat from my brow, I leaned up against a tree and waiting for my breath to catch up with me. The trees on Staten Island always seemed to be dead if they weren't specifically protected by some nature group. These were some of those dead trees, although numerous, none bore any leaves. Normally the sky where Staten Island was a hazy purple from light pollution, Here you could see every last star in the sky. A full moon shone its pale light, too, making it slightly easier to see my surroundings. The whole area was silent. I couldn't hear footsteps, crickets, cars. There was nothing. Should I go back onto the street and look for help, or cut through the woods to the bus stop and 24-7 deli? I chose to cut through. Stupid me. It wasn't long before I reached the abandoned Willow Brook. Several brick-red buildings, some without roofs, some with giant holes in the wall, situated several feet apart, came into view. I had almost forgotten about this place. Given the situation, I was shocked to find myself smiling, remembering the stories and the time I almost visited myself. And then I tripped. I felt a slight sting in my knee as I toppled over, the sound of a rusted wheel spinning breaking the silence. Behind me was an old wheelchair. It had been upright, but my tripping into it had toppled it over. One of the wheel spokes was broken, causing a horrible clacking sound to interrupt the squeal of its rotation. My knee was bleeding. I watched the wheel seemingly spin forever until the sound of footsteps crunching on the ground broke me out of my trance. Shit, 
I muttered, getting up off the ground. The nearest brick building was one with a roof. It would be nice and dark in there. Despite the stinging in my knee, I ran right for the entrance. There wasn't an actual door in the doorway, but the opening didn't allow for much light. I glanced around, barely able to make out the tens of rusted old bed frames lining the walls. The floor of the building was littered with old papers. I listened for footsteps, but heard nothing. Picking up one of the papers, I still remembered what it said as I squinted at each word. Alexis Franchetti, born September 1965, age 7, severe mental illness, talks to herself and numerous fictitious creatures of her imagination, begs other children to play with her, but finds ways to hurt them if allowed. Treatment solitary and electroconvulsive therapy. I looked up at the bed that the paper was in front of, the frame was broken, but at each of the four posts were arm and leg restraints. Above the bed, someone had written in large red paint, I taste the dreams of mad children. The sinking feeling in my stomach caused me to drop the paper and move on. I came to a stairwell. One set of stairs went up, another down. There was no back entrance, so I figured there'd be an exit in the basement. I grabbed the rusted railing and hesitantly took my first step. The stair beneath me creaked and moaned. I took my second step, then a third, a fourth. The stairs didn't seem so bad. I took my fifth step with confidence. With my sixth step, part of the stairwell collapsed beneath me. I fell a few feet right into a mattress reeking with urine. Once I collected myself, I checked for injuries. There was only a cut on my arm, and part of my shirt was ripped. The room I was in was small and closed with an actual door, the first I had seen in this place. The floor was littered with old Burger King wrappers and dirty tissues. There were two filing cabinets, one of which had a battery-powered lantern atop it. The lantern was on. The walls of the room were covered in Polaroids. I studied a few momentarily. At first I thought they were from when Willowbrook was open, due to there being nothing but children. But that wasn't right. There were children, dirty and harassed looking, but the areas within the photos looked just like Willowbrook looked now. There were children playing in the woods, sitting on the rusted bed frames, and even some I'm a bit uncomfortable describing. One photo in particular caught my eye. There was a little girl wearing a powder blue hospital gown. Her shirt brown hair was a mess. She sat upon the rusted metal bed frame her arms and legs restrained to her sides. There was a brown teddy bear next to her. The sound of footsteps and muffled talking coming from the hall outside the room broke my attention away from the Polaroid. I realized quickly that someone must be living here, and I had to get out before they returned. I pushed one of the filing cabinets next to the mattress and made a metallic sound against the wood floor. I vaguely remember seeing a knife stained with black on top of it while I pulled myself back up into the stairwell. I ran for the front door. From the front door, I made out a fire blazing near the entrance. It was either find out who was in the basement or deal with whoever lit the fire. I paused for a moment, heart pounding, trying to figure out what to do. Due to the fire, the room was much more well lit. There were old broken children's toys everywhere. On the bed frame, with a message above it, was an old molded teddy bear. I don't remember seeing it before, but it had been very dark. I heard sound coming from the stairwell. I turned to see a pair of glowing lanterns slowly coming towards me. They were held so close together, so perfectly, they almost looked like glowing eyes. I ran for the fire outside. Never in my life had I been happier to see a group of high school kids getting high. Story number two. I worked part-time security on the night shift at a psychiatric hospital one summer while studying at college. I worked with an older guy named Vincent. He had worked security there for years, so he sort of broke me in until I was ready to spend the shift on my own. The hospital itself dates back to 1845, although much of the building was built far more recently when they extended it in the 90s. It's huge. From outside, it gives the impression of a sprawling Victorian mansion house. That first week, he showed me around, which took almost half an hour considering its size. 
We began a security office where Vincent pointed to the tags posted under each monitor, identifying what area you were looking at on camera. Then we walked quickly through the patrol route I was to take on each shift, pointing out the various areas of the hospital as we went. We took the elevator to the basement floor where we passed a large set of double doors. That's the abandoned section of the hospital, Vincent told me. I thought he shivered a little when I said it. Operating rooms used to be through there before the new section was built. Elevator breaks down quite a lot on this side. Old wiring, he told me. If you want to get back up, you gotta go through there, he said pointing at the double doors. He looked me in the eyes and accentuated as he spoke, the way people do when giving you instructions you must remember. You'll find the stairs to the first floor at the end. Just keep walking, though, until you reach it. I stepped forward to peer through the glass panes on the door, but Vincent placed a hand in front of me and continued to hold my gaze with that expression of grave seriousness on his face. Now it's pitch black down there, and sometimes you have to fumble around in the dark to find the light switch. There's a slight delay, so don't worry if they don't come on right away. His seriousness turned to a look of sympathy then, and he placed a hand on my shoulder. You'll be okay, he said. He was trying to be reassuring, but I didn't understand why. I didn't understand why I was making a big deal of it. Before we left, I took another look at the basement corridor. Something didn't seem right. Then I realized what it was. I was sure I had seen a metal gurney here when I looked at the image on the monitors above. The one tagged basement. It was gone now. The second week, I was on my own. It was a little lonely at times, but I enjoyed the solitude too. I would bring a laptop along and read while listening to music. On this particular night, something caught my eye. A flash of movement on the monitors. It was too quick for me, but I could see one of the doors on the basement level was wide open. One of my duties is to make sure the rooms are clear and locked, so I got up to check it out. I took the elevator down and quickly found the open door. It was just an empty room. I'm not sure what its purpose had been. Clearly, there was nobody inside, so I locked the door, did a quick sweep of some of the other rooms, and then headed back down the corridor to leave. I had the uncomfortable feeling that I was being watched, but I put it down to silence that surrounded me that was making me uneasy. I pushed the call button, but no elevator came. I pressed my ear to the metal doors, listening for the sound of movement, but all I heard were faint creaks and the occasional indeterminate sounds of pipes and other noises that old buildings make. I turned to the heavy doors of the abandoned section. I'd have to make my way through to the stairs that Vincent mentioned. I understood why Vincent might have been uneasy about the place. It was hellish. Apart from the almost total lack of light, it was also incredibly warm and stuffy down there due to the heating being on constantly. I don't know if they bothered to keep it heated. In truth, the corridor was littered with junk, metal bed frames, cardboard boxes. If you were completely down there alone, you were surrounded by pitch black empty rooms and hallways. Even during the day, it's likely the nearest living soul is halfway across the building. I began to navigate through the corridors, remembering to turn off the lights as I went, leaving each preceding corridor in darkness. I wish Vincent had at least walked me through so I'd know how far I had to go. I flicked the switch of the next corridor and waited for the lights to slowly blink on one by one, but nothing happened. I flicked the switch again uselessly. The lights from the corridor behind me provided just enough light that I could make my way through and find the switch for the corridor beyond, which I managed to do successfully, only losing my nerve once when my arm brushed against some spider web. I had to make a second trip to turn off the lights of the previous corridor before it proceeded again to the next room. I could see the exit sign ahead now. From behind, I heard a faint squeaking sound. I turned and peered into the blackness beyond the doors. I could tell the sound had come from a good distance behind me, somewhere back there in the dark. The sound came again, louder this time, nearer. Whoever was back there was getting closer. It sounded like somebody 
running the fingers over glass while running it past it. Squeak. Is somebody there? I called. No answer came. There was a loud crash of metal that startled me so much I recoiled a little. I was genuinely creeped out now, so I booted it out of there pretty fast. I reached the stairs to the second floor. I'd forgotten to turn off the lights, but I didn't care. I climbed the stairs, my heart thumping out of my chest. I pushed the crash bar on the fire doors and escaped into the reassuring brightness of the hospital. I began to relax again as I walked back to the security office. I felt pretty silly actually forgetting in such a panic. Still, I wouldn't like to venture down there again tonight, I thought. The rest of the shift went by without any strangeness. The monitors showed only the hospital empty quarters when I returned. I had put the experience behind me until the next morning when I saw Vincent. He was sitting in front of the monitors, but he stood up when I walked in. How did the shift go, he asked. All right, I guess. I went to check out the basement, and the elevator died on me, but I found the stairs like you said. Otherwise, nothing to report. I told him about the elevator working. I didn't mention what happened after that. Then he got that sympathetic look in his eyes again. Who was that in the basement? Who was what, I asked. He paused for a moment. You didn't see anybody? See what? I had to ask before I showed you, he said. What do you mean, show me what? Then he showed me surveillance footage of the basement. There are two cameras on the basement level. Since that area connects to the morgue where bodies are brought out and where deliveries brought in, I stared at the monitor and saw myself leave the elevator and walk down the hall. There was nothing apparently unusual until I noticed something on the second hallway camera. Standing just below the camera, almost out of frame, was what appeared to be the naked figure of a bald man. Only his upper half was visible, and he was facing away from the cam with his face in his palms like he was in pain. I felt my blood go cold as I watched myself turn the corner and walk down the hall. It would have been impossible not to see him standing there, but I walked straight towards him, completely oblivious to his presence. I locked the door, did my sweep, and headed back to the elevator, all while the man remained standing with his head in his hands. I left the frame as I headed to the abandoned section, the man made some movement. He jerked his head from his hands as though something had caught his attention, and now he was listening. Moments passed, and the man made no further movements. There are no cameras in the old section of the hospital, so I could only estimate I should be almost to the stairs at this point. Then it happened, the scene that had caused me endless sleepless nights. I witnessed the nightmare that the security cameras had recorded, the man's arms reached behind him to grab something. Then he began to move at a sickening speed, and I saw that he had not been standing at all. This man had no legs to speak of. He was dragging behind him a metal stretcher, on which was piled various human appendages, hands, arms, legs, all of which appeared to be moving. The eviscerated man's upper body was somehow propelling itself down the corridor at such speed that the stretcher swerved and struck the walls. Suddenly the image flickered, and suddenly there were hospital apparatus strewn on the corridor that had not been there before, and blood and grime seemed to coat the floors. The second camera revealed more of the stretchers containing animated human parts. A leg lay on the floor, flopping about and kicking the air. A man missing his arms and legs struggled in a wheelchair he was tied to. A group of monstrosities had just begun to shamble into frame, when Vincent stopped the tape and turned to me. You see some strange things on the camera sometimes. I let out the breath I've been holding and waited for the feeling in my legs to return when he said, Just be thankful you don't see those things with your eyes.